I learned from my parents to work hard. You know, I learned my, from my parents to work hard. And uh, I'm not the kind of person that will give excuses. I know many people will want to succeed, but um, they don't have the commitments to work hard and do what it takes for them to succeed. It doesn't work like that. Success is not magical. It just does, just doesn't happen. No, no. It's not like, you know, it just happens. No, no, no. You have to work. You have to work hard. So um, I learned from my parents when I was young, um, hard work. Uh, my dad had a regular job at uh, the bicycle plant. I grew up in Chipata, you know, in Zambia's eastern province. So yeah. my dad had a regular job at the bicycle plant, but then he also had part-time jobs that he used to do, you know, so that he can earn extra money. And my mom uh, worked and stayed at home, you know, and uh, she ran a business, you know. So she used to make um, she used to make bands. That's what took me through primary school. My mom used to make bands and sell bands. I would also go to the market and sell with her when I was a kid, Yummy. you know? So, yeah, you know, so I learned to work hard. My parents modeled what it means to work hard and not to give up. Born and raised in the motherland, chasing a better life, story of an immigrant. The concrete pastures. The concrete pastures. Hello, family. Welcome back to Concrete Pastures. I am Nancy Mulemwa Sisi. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And to all of our new listeners, welcome to the family. This is a space that allows myself and others to share our stories as we deconstruct the world's view of immigrant status. We unlock the joys, the laughs, the bravery that being an immigrant or dreamer brings. We continue to grow our community as you watch this episode support us by subscribing to this channel this way we can reach as many people like you so stay a while on this episode and uh today's guest oh my god she's my fellow zambian she's my uh, fellow immigrant i'm excited to have her here she's been doing a lot of amazing things in our community and um Trust me, you'll be inspired by her story. Her name is Dr. Sombo Muzata. She is an assistant professor of political science at James Madison University. She has a PhD in public policy and administration from Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. Dr. Muzata holds a Master of Business Administration, MBA, specializing in strategy and Harriet what university she is a trained accountant a fellow of the associate of chartered certified accountants acca she has a vast international development experience working as a country director in zambia diaconia a swedish global nonprofit. as a country director uh, dr mzata was responsible for strategic planning, fundraising, and programming, implementing, and was um, always influenced by the agenda that was special theme streamed in the Arconia work. Ooh, welcome to Concrete Pastures, Doctor. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate it, and thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, that was just a little bit of your achievement. And we're going to get into even more achievement that you have. So congratulations on everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, for starters, you're my fellow immigrant. Love the jacket. Thank uh, you. Before we actually got on here, I started to record. You were telling me the story behind the jacket. Yes. You mind sharing this with everybody? <laughs> Okay, I love All the right. colors. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I got the fabric uh, back home in Lusaka. Um, I was in Lusaka March um, 27th, and I came back to the U.S. Uh, February the 8th. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you go to Lusaka, you have to make sure you get to Kamwala Market. Yeah. You don't go to Kamwala when you're in Lusaka, then you haven't been to Lusaka. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just like I always say, when you go to Zambia, you have to make sure you go to the Victoria Falls. So I did it all, you know. Um, you did? You went to the Victoria Falls? Of course I did. Falls? I did. I did. So 
<laughs> yeah, I flew into Livingston Saturday morning and I uh, flew back to Lusaka on Monday. So I just spent the weekend in Livingston. It was a blast. It was amazing. So back to the jacket. Um, I saw this fabric in Kamwala. Then I really liked it a lot. And um, I got a piece. And then I went to a tailor, a local tailor, uh, a guy called Emmanuel. And um, he made the jacket. I really like it. And he made the dress I'm wearing as well. So uh, I just like that so much. Wow. I love to promote um, local arts. And uh, this is a local business, you know. So Listen, I'm going to Zambia <laughs> next month. So I'm going to I'm going to be asking for the contact. I need yeah. some local outfits, our materials. I mean, it showcases what Africa is about, really. Yeah. Like our materials are very different yeah. from anything that I, you know, we wear. So I'll be contacting Manuel. Yeah, I will. So I'll give I, you I the number for the tailor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. need some dresses. They are quick though. The way they 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 like put everything together, they're very together. quick. Yeah, very quick. Yeah. So you are my fellow immigrant, and you've been here for quite some time. I really was looking forward to bring you on here to share your story, your inspirational story. Um. Just walk us through. I know you are, um, all of us almost have almost a similar story. What has been your journey like being an immigrant here in America? That's a very interesting one. So um, I wouldn't say I've been around for a long time. Um, I've been here less than eight years, less than seven years, I think. Um, I came to the U.S. Um, 2016. Hmm. Um, yeah, so this year it's going to be seven years. Uh, this since year. I came. Yeah, this year it's going to be seven years. But I came um, six plus years ago now. And I came um, to study for my um, graduate school, basically, you know. Um, so um, I came for graduate school. I started um, the PhD program in 2017 um, at Virginia Commonwealth University in the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. Uh, let me put a little plug here on the L. Douglas Wilder School of, of Government and Public Affairs. Um, so the school is named for um, the first African-American to be elected as a governor in the United States after um, the Civil War. So um, yeah, so uh, uh, Governor Wilder um, uh, was uh, governor here in Virginia and um, under his uh, leadership as governor for the state of Virginia, uh, he implemented a lot of policies. And um, one of the big things that he did was he implemented or he started what is known as the rainy day fund, uh, which is basically a fund set aside for a rainy day. When things are not too well, you fall back on that fund. So Governor Wilder uh, uh, put that in place. And uh, we know that we just uh, had the pandemic recently. So uh, the state of uh, Virginia was uh, sort of uh, well prepared in a way based off the mm -hmm. foresight, uh, thanks to Governor Wilder. So uh, I, I'm also, and, and the reason why I'm putting in this plug, I'm also um, in quotation marks an ambassador, <laughs> you know, I uh, uh, of the Wilder School, I would say that um, I am a recipient of um, the Legacy Award, the L. Douglas Wilder Leadership um, Legacy Award. So uh, every time I put that plug, I say that statement, it's just next to what I do. When I'm starting to teach a class the first time, I say, I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University, and I went to the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. I think it's uh, one of the best schools in the country, so I'm really proud to be associated with the school. I'm saying it's um it's amazing. It's prestigious to go to that to, to, yeah. to that school. So you should be proud, <laughs> yeah. and we are proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So so that's how I came to the U.S. Um. So being a student and being an immigrant, um, it's uh it's very tough. Um, I'm not going to paint a picture like it's rosy, it's nice, um, it's tough. Um, it was particularly tough for me for a number of reasons. And uh, I'll just share a few here. Um, so when I worked in Zambia, I worked for an international development organization and I was a country director. In short, I was the boss and uh, I reported to people who were out of the country. So my people that I reported to were in Kenya and uh, you know, um, they weren't in Zambia. So it was Kenya and Sweden. Um, mm. I would have conversations with people higher above me. Um, it was those levels. And um, so I was in charge of the country office and uh, I had people that were under me. 
I come to graduate school, uh, I become uh, a research assistant. Okay, so which means mm -hmm. I have to be under somebody. The dynamic is different. And it was very different for me. And uh, right through my studies, you know, it's it's a journey. It's a humbling journey uh, because, you know, you are coming from a place of uh, quite some success. That's the place that I came from, um, you know, leading an international organization and, mm. um, you know, um, uh, but coming down to being a student, um, I, I remember, <laughs> I'll say this, I remember. I remember one day, um, so I have my American parents. I'm going to talk about my American parents and I'll talk about my biological parents as well because I'm who I am because of my biological parents. Uh, so I hope later in the conversation, I can cover that as well. Um, yeah. So uh, I remember one day um, I had to go to, um, you know, uh, the store. I went to buy a new laptop. And um, so I'm in Best Buy, I buy a laptop and um they give it to me and I'm like and then they say you have to set it up yourself and okay what is happening here and uh, as I'm leaving the, sh the the big the the best buy store I'm like wait I've never done this before they have to set it up at my office back home I had a technician who would do this how am I going to fix this so I go back and I'm like excuse me can you help me set this thing up and then he looks at me and he says you're supposed to do it on your own so that was the first shock for me okay this is my you know student journey and adjusting journey uh, as an immigrant so I take my laptop and um, I'm walking out of Best Buy um and uh, I go back. I'm like, no, no, no. You know, you don't understand. You know, <laughs> can you just get this thing running for me? And then he says, oh, sure, I can help you with that. So then he starts setting it up and then he's asking me these questions and I'm answering and we're setting it up and we at least are getting it running. Actually, he'd given it to me and he was just telling me do this and I was doing stuff and I was getting it set up. Okay. So, um, <laughs> And then when that is done, I'm walking out of the store and I'm going to the car and I remember um, I needed to put gas in the car. Okay. So I go to the gas pump and I have to put gas in the car. Nancy, I'm like, what is happening today? I have to set up a computer on my own. At home, somebody would do that. I have to put gas in the car. At home, somebody would take the car to the gas station for me and somebody would put gas in my car oh my now God. on this day I'm doing these two things and somehow that's the day that I just broke down you know I put gas in the car then I drove it by um, one of the parking lots um, at the shopping mall and then I started crying <laughs> I started crying because I was asking myself is this what the meaning of this journey is you know like I have to put gas in the car alone and I have to start setting up my computer alone. You see the things that we have at home that are real privilege, but we don't even see it that way. Mm -hmm. you know? Of course, our labor market is structured differently. Um, I cried. I sat in the car. I cried. And then I told myself, okay, I have to go. I have to go home. So I drove home. I got home and my American parents looked at me. My eyes were red. <laughs> they were like, Samba, what was happening? What's happened to you? And then I started crying even more, you know, because I was like, it's like the world is falling on me. That's what I was feeling like inside in that moment. And, um, and then I started thinking about school, how, you know, um, you know, you feel sort of powerless, like you're not in charge anymore. If you've been in charge for a long time, yeah. once that is taken away from you, it's hard. You need to work on yourself to be able to transition into this new space and reality. Yeah. So, you know, and then I just started crying because it was like this computer thing, I have to get it fixed. And then here people put gas in the car on their own. And so at that time, I was just finding everything I could complain about so that I can cry, <laughs> you know? So I did cry a lot. Um, and then I think I, I'd been working so hard. I was trying to keep up with all the assignments and then also my work, you know, um, as a research assistant. So it was, it was a little bit, and I just broke down and I cried. So when I say that, um, I'm not going to sugarcoat the story, you know, um, it, it, transitioning as an immigrant is not easy 
And that was not the first time that I cried. I've cried over the journey at several times. And sometimes it's crying because you're helpless. You can't do anything about what is happening. And at times because um, you are happy and you're grateful, you know, you achieve great success. And yes. then you're like, how do I celebrate this? So you cry at times, uh, but the cryings out of despair, um, you know, just got more um, in the initial stages of the journey, um, you know, transitioning um, to being a student and then um, getting to, you know, uh, work through, you know, the schoolwork and everything. It's, it's, I, I, you know, the funny thing is that I took so many pictures of myself in that terrible state, like when I'll just break down and I'm crying and I'm like, ha, huh, I need to do a book about tears and success. <laughs> because <laughs> I did cry a lot of tears on this journey transitioning as an immigrant so I'll end there for now <laughs> oh my gosh um wow <laughs> it's funny that um we are laughing now because mm -hmm. I, I've had I, I think I think the tears don't end no. I've, I, I love how you even said it it's different stages yeah. of your journey and also sometimes you're crying because it's tears of joy and mm -hmm. you want to celebrate but sometimes even like look when you're celebrating there's nobody really there that you would love to have around like your family they're back home mm -hmm. it's just you and mm -hmm. yeah but um yeah it's um it, our journeys are very interesting just to, to put it that way um but how were you able to carry yourself through um the journey of yes i'm going to cry but i have to move to to go through it yeah to go um, forward I because yeah. I'm sure there's somebody who is new to the country and they might be feeling alone mm -hmm. and they are going through their own, you know, tears. Mm -hmm. um, how do they go to the point where they have to dry their tears and yeah. move forward? Yeah. I think cry, don't be completely in despair. Um, and building community is very important right when you come. So for me, um, it was a community that I started here. My American parents, um, they are just amazing. Uh, so uh, they looked after me and um, I'm, I, they're family now to me here. So I found that to be very helpful. And then also um, my family back home, um, you know, I, I utilized WhatsApp to the most. Like I would, I have times when I'm on WhatsApp um, that's my personal uh, practice daily. Um, I don't go to WhatsApp uh, before 2 p.m. Okay, so when I wake up in the morning, I'll get my work done. I'll get everything. I'll do ABCD. I'll say my prayer and, and all. And um, I will get my day going. And I'm not going to come to WhatsApp. I only come to WhatsApp after 2 p.m. every day. Uh, the only time that I come to WhatsApp earlier is uh, maybe on a weekend you know, and it's okay. I can relax my rules. But during the week, um, I have those boundaries that I set for myself. So I made it a practice every day. It's 2 p.m. or 2.30 to get, get to WhatsApp so I can talk to my family. I send text messages and I make phone calls, um, talk to my mom. I did that every single day, like literally every single day. And um, yeah, and that helped, that saw me through because you know you you are living in distance and in space and you know that you know your people are very far you know and you're in a totally foreign land and yeah. it's it's um it's very hard um i i can't um i can't underestimate um the emotions that you get to go through when you're living far away from home um so it was the immediate family that I set up here. It was my family back home. And of course, friends at home, they're friends that really stood with me the entire six plus years, um, you know, that have stood with me the entire six plus years. They would always check on me and I always check back on them. And, um, and also praying, you know, um, I think when you're an immigrant, you have a different spiritual journey. I have to say that, you know, uh, because, you learn to depend on, um, you learn to depend differently, you know, and um, 
and and you learn to see things differently and you learn to believe differently you know when you're at home you have the comfort of everybody around you know people that know you and you can easily go to the next person or you can call somebody hey um you know you know and i'm not saying that yeah. you know that's how life is characterized here um and you know like uh but the, i'm just trying to demonstrate how easy it is for certain things to be done when you're at home and here it's not like that so here first you learn to plan properly because you can't run out of wunga takuro wala tumina phone yeah takupelio wunga for walu kukosa so you mm-hmm. need, you learn to plan so you yeah. learn to plan that every single time you have your wunga so that your shema can be had when you finish cooking it so you learn to plan and then you learn to um to depend on god you know and um, you learn to pray differently and that's just that's 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 just a given at least that has been my experience you know you could say total that again. dependence total yeah. dependence you know yeah. so it's um, it's really been very um, interesting um to have to learn um to have to learn to de- to depend differently to have to learn to plan for every little thing you know and basically doing what um you know the scripture say commit your plans unto the lord and he'll bring them to pass so you you hold on to you know uh you hold on to your faith uh very tightly and um i think that helps to see one through um at the end of the day um uh, it's a journey of faith and um i love what the bible says in hebrews 11 faith is a substance of hope for things not seen it's basically the evidence of what you don't see so every single day when i woke up i would tell myself i would write down in my journal and i would always the start of the day and end of the journey at end of the day i would always write a little note and i would put dr sombo mozata and i'm not even a doctor i haven't even you know written my exams i haven't even defended my dissertation i always used to sign off like that to myself because that's what i was seeing that's the faith point i was holding on you know um substance of things not seen it's not seen the paper hasn't come through the certificate hasn't come through the mail yet i haven't walked you know to go and get wooded as a phd but i believed that that's what was going to happen at the end of the journey so every time i wrote in my journal i signed off dr sombo mozata and i look back and i'm like ha okay <laughs> so The journey is exciting it's interesting and like I said earlier it's tears but then it's learning how what do I do when those tears come you know who do I run to and um yeah Being an immigrant can be hard having been away from my home country for over 20 years has allowed me to experience these hardships first hand Throughout my journey I've had a lot of challenges that were hard to bear juggling adjustment to a new country obtaining my immigration papers, getting married, having children, establishing my career and finding time for myself. Even though I've always had faith, I also relied on therapy, which gave me the tools to cope with the issues life brought me. My fellow dreamers, let's remove the stigma around therapy and normalize seeking help with today's sponsor, Better Health. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help you. Go to betterhelp.com/coquitpastures for 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help in as little as 48 hours. Well said. I'm like you preaching to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Uh well said. Uh, um we, we need to have faith. Uh I wouldn't survive America. I, I say it over and over if I didn't have a prayer life. If I didn't believe in something bigger than me. Yeah. Um it's tough. You said it really well. You have to uh, um you learn how to adjust. I love the analogy of Shima and how uh you cannot go knock on your neighbor's house and you know can you give me some milli meal so I can harden up my my Shima nobody comes nobody n- nobody's coming it's just mm-hmm. you and 
your higher power, your God, and that's mm -hmm. it. Yep. Wow. Oh, all right. I want to get into your achievements. <laughs> You've been able to reinvent yourself and you're passionate about reinventing yourself. Wow. You've already touched on some of it already on how us immigrants really do. Um, but in your career path, you've been able to reinvent yourself. How important is that for all of us? Because I'll tell you this, for a lot of us immigrants, we get a job, we want to stay on it because you just, mm -hmm. you hold on to it so tight. Even if we end up firing you, it's like the most depressing thing ever. Um, but a lot of us are fearful to change mm -hmm. careers mm -hmm. because we don't know what that career is going to give us. Maybe it's not going to pay us as much as we are getting paid. So how have you been able to do that for yourself? Yeah, uh, I think it's been, I, I call it a practice. I call reinventing myself as a practice. And I think it's a practice of faith. I'm going to say that again, uh, because it's stepping into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Every time you're changing your career or you're moving from one country to another country, you're basically stepping into the unknown, you know. Um, so you need to have some level of faith to do that. I always say that you also need to have um, your good level of madness with you hold on to your weirdness hold on to, hold on to your crazy uh, because you need that to take you through um, on days when you know the chips are really low yeah. um, so I started off as an accounts clerk maybe that's the starting point that I should say in this story I started off as an accounts clerk and um, I studied accounting um, I studied ACCA and uh, first I studied the national accounting technician in Zambia I did the NATEC program uh, before that, I did CCA. I'll talk about CCA only because it was a prestigious program. It's called the mm -hmm. College Certificate in Accounting. I think it was offered by um, ATC, the Accountancy Training College in Chingola. And, uh, you know, CCA was a prestigious program. Like, it was a program where they put, uh, where we had the best of the best, you know. Uh, so it's all those kids that got like 10 points and below or 12 points and below at grade 12 who got themselves into that program. So I was in the CCA program and um, it was very hard, but it prepared me for, um, you know, finding myself and changing myself several times over in my career. So after CCA, I did uh, my national accounting technician program. Then I um, did my ACCA. Then later on, I did my MBA. And uh, I started off as an accounts clerk, like I had said a little earlier. And from being an accounts clerk, it's basically accounting work that you're doing, you know, posting journal entries um, in the accounting package. Um, and at that time, it was writing in an actual hardcover book because we hadn't migrated to using um, computer software. Wow. So it's maintaining petty cash and having an actual book and writing the entries. So it was very, very interesting. So learning the double entry system and implementing it, going to the bank, standing in the queue in the bank for hours. Uh, I used to work in Kitwe and Kitwe is a mining town. So when the miners are getting paid, you better go to the bank early. So I would stand on the queue in the in the bank. I think at times it could be an hour or two hours because there's so many customers that need to be served. And, uh, you know, so starting out my career like that and learning the ins and outs of accounting work and basically business work. And then later on transitioning, um, you know, to working as a country director for an international development organization. I know the NGO sector inside out. I did NGO fundraising and I did that very well, succeeded at doing that, you know. Um, I did change management and I succeeded at doing that, strategic planning, you know, project implementation and all these big, exciting things. And um, what I learned throughout this process is that I need to allow myself to learn the part of me that I haven't learned. You know, and that's what the whole point of reinventing yourself is and reinventing your career. Each one of us is, um, you know, we're all amazing. We all have different kinds of abilities. And for the most part, we don't get into those nodes of the different abilities because we put blocks, barriers in our heads. Okay. It's fear. For the most part, it is fear. Oh, yeah. And yet, if you look at a country like Zambia, where people of faith, so then you start asking, okay, this doesn't gel. So for the most part, I think we are afraid to 
um, step into the unknown. Stepping into the unknown requires us to have some level of faith, requires us to let go at some point. And I think I've been able to let go and step into those phases of the unknown at many different phases. So moving from being an accounts clerk and working in that space and then moving on to this job that I had absolutely no idea of, you know, when I started working as country director, I was asked to do that for administrative purposes to close off the country office. But I didn't close off the country office. I was able under my leadership to raise 2.7 plus million dollars and continue operations. So I managed change. I learned how to write proposals. I did all these nice and exciting things. I stepped out of my comfort zone, you know, went to do programs at the University of Oxford and learned about all these amazing management things that I applied um, into my work, okay? It was stepping into the unknown. Um, it was just believing that if I go on this path, um, you know, it's going to work out. And it's the same now I teach, I teach public budgeting and uh, I always say that, you know, and this is very true. You can ask my students. I don't go with notes to class. I don't. Yeah. I just carry my whiteboard marker when I'm going to class. I carry my keys to open the door, my whiteboard marker and my phone to open um, the software that I'm using in the class. I just go as me to go and teach. Why? It's because I'm teaching public budgeting and budgeting systems and budgeting has been the same all these years okay so stuff that I learned 20 plus years ago as a kid when I was studying for my ACCA is stuff that I leverage on on a daily basis when I'm standing in class to teach so I think um, okay I'll probably talk about this later on so that's 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 the reality that I live and 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 I think I've been able to do this and I'm able to do this because um, I've been very deliberate with uh, what I have chosen to do for my career. So you have to sit, you have to think, and um, you have to be very deliberate. You know, um, It's very hard for a person who has been a dancer you know, to go and learn engineering so that you can fly uh, to space. You mm -hmm. explode midair. It happens with a spaceship and it can also happen with a person's career. So if a I always encourage people, if you're planning your career, um, you have to make sure that you're doing stuff that you at least have some baseline expertise in because that baseline expertise helps you uh, to just tweak it and get better or be something a little higher than you were. So if you ask me, um, teaching public budgeting has really been built off my being an accounts clerk and learning and being patient, you know, uh, doing the double entry and uh, knowing government taxation and, uh, you know, um, and, and knowing, you know, assets and liabilities, knowing how to prepare budgets. So it's, I've just used uh, the baseline and I have just changed that um, along the way, you know, um, and been able to get into different careers uh, based off what I learned when I was a kid. So that's how I have uh, reinvented myself over the years. So I teach public budgeting and uh, to graduate students. And then I also teach the budgetary process to undergraduate students. And um, I teach economic and community development. I'm very passionate about that because when I worked as country director for Diakonia in Zambia, um, it was community development work that we did. So I have an economic and community development class that I teach and it's amazing, it's exciting. So um, it's not things that are completely out of this world, but it's things that I have done in my past that I've now you know, uh, polished um, along the way and it makes me to come in the space as an expert. I also teach public administration. I love that because I love theory. Um, I sometimes don't come out as a theorist, but I really love theory a lot. And uh, whenever I get an opportunity for that, I'm going to um, have a conversation around our theoretical frameworks. So that's what I do. And that's how I've reinvented myself over the years. So from account clerk to professor, a lot of work. My brain is going wild. <laughs> <laughs> First, as to <laughs> how you find the time to teach all of these different classes you're doing. Aside from that, I'm while you were talking, all I'm thinking about can fear and faith it coexist. Yes, 
Yes. Um, I think um, to be afraid um, doesn't mean that you don't have faith. And to have faith doesn't mean that you're not afraid. You know, you can have so much faith, but you can have an element of fear because that's what we are as human beings. I think what makes a difference is having the courage um, to go on and press on when those moments of fear come so that um, you push forth your faith as what you're holding on. Um, so uh, faith and fear can coexist, but our fight every single day is to make sure that our faith is more than our fear. Because if we let our fear to be more, we're not going to go anywhere. Uh, I'll tell you something um, 2019, um, a young lady that I know, uh, you know, I was having a conversation with her and then she goes like, hey, uh, what if you don't get your PhD? What if you fail? What are you going to do? You, you've you moved your kids, you moved your family, you're in the US with everybody. What if you fail? What are you going to do? And I told her, I'm not going to fail. I was like two years into the program and I'll be very honest with you. It was a very tough time for me in the program at that moment, you know, uh, it was pretty tough. Uh, I was super stressed. Maybe I was bent out and I could have even been depressed if I went to get an actual diagnosis. I actually mm -hmm. was, you know, I was depressed because of a lot of things going on in my life. But um, when that young lady asked and, um, you know, she asked me, she said, what if you fail? I just told her I'm not going to fail you know? Um, and I told her that I believe that I'm going to succeed. I'm going to make it. I have faith that I'm going to make it. Okay. I'm not going um, to, uh, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to succeed. I don't do something and, um, you know, um, uh, uh, fail at the end of the day. Uh, I'll have learned something, but a project of this magnitude is not a project where you learn. It's a project where you succeed. And I told her, I said, um, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to succeed. You know, uh, it was very interesting that somebody could be afraid on my behalf that maybe I would fail. I wasn't afraid myself. So people are going to be afraid on your behalf. They will think that it's not going to work out, but you shouldn't be the person that thinks it's not going to work out. You should be the person that believes that it is going to work out because the vision is given to an individual and not the community. Okay. So faith is a very personal thing and hard work and courage and everything. It's very personal, you know? So, so when she asked me if, if I was, what, what I'd do if I would fail. And I was like, no, I'm not going to fail. I didn't have a plan to fail and I didn't fail, you know? And it doesn't mean that the people that fail have a plan to fail. A lot of things happen in life and at times people fail. And I've also failed several times. We could have a whole separate podcast where I talk about so many of my failures, you know, and uh, what I have learned from that. Uh, but you asked me the question, can faith and fear exist? Yes, they can exist together. But we have to learn to ensure that our faith is more than our fears at every single time so that we can excel. Or else fear pulls you down. It paralyzes you. You just stop because you're afraid. Wow. I, I I love that you actually even touched on um, other people's fears because a lot of us stop uh, pushing forward because people project their fears yeah. on us. Yeah. And we start to believe what they are saying. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm so glad that you touched on that and uh, well said. How did you meet your American parents? Oh, that's very that's very interesting. So, um, I mean, they're amazing people. Uh, it's uh, my American mom. Her name is Dr. Gasson, and uh, my American dad is uh, uh, Robert uh, Antonelli. So, uh, I met my American parents because we were paired when I came on the uh, Mandela Washington Fellowship Program with American families um, mm. to have a weekend with, you know, just have conversations and hang out for the day. And uh, it was supposed to be hang out for the day, like two, three hours. For me, it's been hanging out for six plus years. Actually, today in the morning, I was chatting with uh, with my American mom, you know. And uh, yeah, so so they've been, um, they're amazing people. They've, um, you know, they helped me um, when times were really tough. And um, yeah, you know, I think about this whole journey and I see the grace of God you know, at every stage. Um, yeah. I'll tell you something. My American parents um, changed a lot of things for me. 
Um, you know, most of the times I was many steps ahead of my colleagues um, in terms of the social settings here uh, because of my parents, you know. Um, so you'll find international students are probably going to take long to get their driver's license because they don't have a car here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to take long to get their um, social security numbers because, yeah. I mean, you don't need that when you're an international student. You know, yep. the university has a way in which they can um, get you running in the system. And maybe you can get a social security number later because you would need it. And for the most part, people just get uh, tax IDs, you know. Uh, but thanks to my American parents, you know, I was just around like for a week. And then they said, OK, girl, we're getting you situated now. We're going to get you your social security number and we're going to get you your driver's license. And next we were in the social security office and my social security number was being processed. And within a month, I had my U.S. driver's license because I, you know, I was using their car. I used their car, did my practice and I went to the DMV and I passed my test, you know. So my parents, my American parents have really been very, very instrumental. And then when my family came just helping us to transition, you know, um, all those, uh, you know, interesting things and challenges that you get into when you're a foreigner, you don't have, uh, you know, a person um, to, uh, you know, sign for you when you're trying to rent a property because you don't have, you know, credit history, all those practical things, you know, uh, my American parents were really there for me uh, when I was getting my, you know, first apartment that I lived in. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, uh, and just being there to listen and also supporting me financially, because at some point, um, you know, and most of the times that I, you know, run dry, <laughs> I always get in touch and uh, I get the kind of support that I need. So in that sense, I look at it, I'm like, oh, God must have known that I need these people. Yeah. And he put them in the way for me. And I've got amazing mentors along the way. Um, when we're talking about careers and all, I think we we have to make sure that we have good mentors who help us uh, with our careers, who speak for us and are in rooms where we are not, who advocate for us. And I've had uh, very many amazing mentors that have helped me uh, on this journey uh, in the last six years. So, yeah. What have you learned from your um, parents or even your experience being here so far? Um, I think I'll talk about the first thing that I learned from my biological parents. Uh, my mom um, is home in Zambia and um, uh, my dad passed away 10 years ago now. Uh, I learned from my parents to work hard. You know, I learned my, from my parents to work hard. And uh, I'm not the kind of person that will give excuses. I know many people will want to succeed, but um, they don't have the commitments to work hard and do what it takes for them to succeed. It doesn't work like that. Success is not magical. It just does just doesn't happen. No, no. It's not like, you know, it just happens. No, no, no. You have to work. You have to work hard. So um, I learned from my parents when I was young, um, hard work. Uh, my dad had a regular job at uh, the bicycle plant. I grew up in Chipata you know, in Zambia's Eastern province. So yeah. my dad had a regular job at the bicycle plant, but then he also had part-time jobs that he used to do, you know, so that he can earn extra money. And my mom uh, worked and stayed at home, you know, and uh, she ran a business, you know, so she used to make, um, she used to make bands. That's what took me through primary school. My mom used to make bands and sell bands. I would also go to the market and sell with her when I was a kid, Yummy. you know? So, yeah, you know, so I learned to work hard. My parents modeled what it means to work hard and not to give up. Okay. Uh, I know many people give up when they're just about to hit success, but because they haven't seen it, then they give up, they stop. So I learned to work hard from my parents and I've carried that value throughout and I've working so hard to pass down that value to my children um so earlier in the conversation i was telling you that mozata is a lovale uh, name and it means you know a worker or a hard worker working basically you know um so i'm like the name followed me <laughs> you know no it fits so, my name yeah fits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. so um you cannot substitute hard work yes we need favor we need, a, we need a dosage of good luck. But if you work very hard, um, certain opportunities appear like they were meant for you. 
because you have worked hard for them. So uh, working hard all the time um, is, is very important. And working hard, not because you want to please people. So yeah. I work hard because I do it for myself. You know, I do it as an act of pleasure. I do it as a lifestyle. When I come to something, I bring my whole being there. Okay. And I'm not going to bring excuses. I don't do that. You know, so, so, so hard work um, is one thing that I've learned that is very important. Um, um, my time at home and also even more here, you know, when you're in the U.S., you're black, you're a woman. We know the drill. You have to work hard. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I love it. <laughs> love it, love it. But uh, I think it's a lot. And, you know, so most of the times I do not volunteer information that I haven't been asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very honest with you because uh, it can turn into a complete motivation speech or um, <laughs> it can turn into a sermon. <laughs> Listen, this is your space. And you and I are here just having yeah. tea, and conversation yeah that's yeah. it so, and the rest yeah. of the world is listening that's all <laughs> yeah yeah so I think it's hard work and um, I talked about having good mentors and leveraging on those um, have good relationships I talked about having faith um, mm -hmm. yeah and um, you know don't give up on yourself. Um, showing up is very important. I remember there was a time um, I look at the pictures. Like I said, I took many pictures uh, when I was crying. I have yeah. so many pictures of me crying in despair, confused, and just thinking, what am I doing? You know, um, I have so many of those pictures. And, um, you know, I look back now, I even look up, I look back at some of the pictures where, you know, I cut my hair and sometimes I'll go with my hair not really combed, you know, like just twisted a little or just kinky, yes. you know, and uh, there's hair politics in the US, you know, and uh, your hair needs to look in a certain way. But I showed up for myself in many spaces and some of those spaces I showed up uh, with my hair, you know, not in the format that would be acceptable. But the point I'm trying to demonstrate is that show up for yourself, even if you're not feeling great. Because on this journey, I've had times when I haven't felt great, but I showed up. In fact, uh, I have this very interesting story. Um, so um, I'm a recipient of the Albert Einstein, you know, award. It's the Albert Einstein visa. Because I think it's a great honor. Yeah, um, it is. It is. M Melania Trump also uh, got one. So yeah. I was, I wanted you to explain to us <laughs> how you get that. <laughs> So, so, you know, the circumstances that I had been in uh, were not the best of circumstances. I think, like I said earlier, you know, the tears, the depression, um, I think I was really at a time when I was really, really low in my spirit. Mm. And uh, because if I look at the pictures during that time, I'm like, wait, I would actually walk out with my hair looking like this. What, what was going on here? My wife is a dumb walker. <laughs> I'm just trying to be funny here, you know, uh, but it's a tough, I had a tough time and yeah. uh, I had an option at that time to just stay at home and cry over my situation mm -hmm. or step out, you know, and, uh, you know, thankfully I stepped out. Uh, I had this conference in Washington, DC. I was making a presentation and I nailed it. You know, when I'm going to do a presentation, I nail it. So I went there and it's because I, I'll prepare, you know, and I'll get the work in and, um, so I prepared for my presentation and I got into this, um, you know, conference room and I looked, you know, when you're talking about public budget, so you're talking about economic issues, most of the times in these spaces, there are few people that look like you and me. These are spaces that are dominated by white people and Asians. Okay. Yep. So I was making a presentation at an academic conference at the American University and I was the black person in the room. And then uh, just before we started speaking, another black person came into the room, a woman. And I was like, oh, this is beautiful. You know, I'm going to do very well here. So I impress my sister and she gets out of here proud of me. Of course, I do it for myself. Um, I don't want to do a presentation or do something and it's substandard. So I did my presentation and I knew it was great. And there were people asking me questions and I was answering. And of course, I was asking them questions because I been working on developing a framework so you need to get input from people 
And uh, when that part was done, you know, uh, we were going to go out uh, for lunch. You know, we're going to go out for another session, then lunch later on. And then I looked in the room, this black girl disappeared. And I was like, wait, where did she go? You know, so I started looking out for this girl. Okay. So um, <laughs> I go to lunch. Finally, I go to lunch and um, I see her in the hall. And then I go right straight to where she was. Can I sit with you? She says, oh, Sombo, come sit with me. And I'm like, huh? She called my she name. my name. I was like, of course, because she was in my session, so she should she should know my name. So I sit down. And then she says, oh, I'm sorry. After the conversation, I had to leave because I was going to make my own presentation in another room. So I couldn't stay back to, you know, talk to you. You did very well. Your presentation was excellent. And then she starts saying all these nice things. And I'm just listening in and I'm smiling. And uh, clearly, you know, physically present and smiling and all, but um, I was at a bad place, um, you know, emotionally and mentally. And uh, and then she goes like, um, Sombo, you know, you can get the national interest waiver. You know, the, the U.S. has these special visas that they give uh, to experts and, you know, to people, um, you know, um, of your caliber. You can do that. I said, oh, OK. And then um, so she put in my search, uh, you know, um, the, the website link and yeah. um, and she told me specifically what I needed to do. You know, I was supposed to apply for a national interest waiver and it had a number. OK. And uh, me in my craziness, when all the stuff is done and I'm heading back home uh, to Richmond, that time I used to live in Richmond. I'm on the train. I go to that website and the first thing that I see is, um, you know, EB1A, you know, extraordinary ability. And I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. And then I read the requirements and it says uh, you need to demonstrate international acclaim. How do you demonstrate international acclaim? What is international acclaim? You, it has a whole list of things that you need to prove. And I read that and I'm like, no, that's not what that girl said. No, no, no. This is too much. I think she said something. And, you know, at that moment, I put the phone away and I'm like, this is a no starter. Oh, this is really tough. You know, they are, they're asking the people that they're asking are people that, you know, stellar, you know, mus musical performers and whatever. <laughs> I, I don't fall in this category. And then I started thinking about that back and forth thoughts, you know, um, a year, a year later, you know. OK, so this happened in March when I met this girl and we had this conversation and I checked. And instead of checking where I was supposed to check, I straight to check the first thing that I saw. And I was wowed by the, you know, just extraordinary ability. Oh, my gosh, that sounds so good. That's what I want. And then when I started reading and I was like, wait. This is above my grade. And then a part of my mind was like, no, this is where you belong. I'll be very honest with you, Nancy, for some weird reason, I was so convinced that I had extraordinary ability and I could demonstrate the extraordinary ability. <laughs> Why not? You know, you have to get a lawyer, an attorney to help you file for that. And again, because I was a broke graduate student, I didn't have money. Okay. <laughs> so yeah people pay like i think it's between it's over ten thousand dollars you know oh, wow yeah it's it's a lot of money now uh, for somebody to file that for you it's a lot how proving that you're extraordinary to the u.s government it's not an easy thing you know? yeah so um so i sat down and i started thinking you extraordinary yavutai you know, <laughs> and my mind was stuck on that. You know, it's like I couldn't even go to Google and search other things. My mind was just stuck on that thing. I'm like, Chamine, this is what I am. I'm extraordinary. And this is what I'm going to write. And now I see, I'm like, I've never filled in any government paperwork. How do I even do this? You know, it was, it was all the weirdness. I think I brought my weirdness to that. Uh, and I brought my faith to it and a lot of faith, actually, uh, because I later on, you know, um, at some point I told myself, I don't need to do this. It's not going to work out. And then uh, that was March. And then so this is so weird, you know. Um, in October, or no November, in November, I went to the West Coast. I went to California to attend another conference. And weirdly, this Nigerian girl was there as well. 
that doesn't happen. You can't, unless you're friends, you attend the same conferences. If you're not friends, it's practically impossible to be found in the same academic conference in the US mm. because it's different fields and sectors, okay? I was presenting public budgeting and this was an NGO conference, a nonprofit conference, you know? It's a nonprofit and voluntary associations conference. But she had written for a fellowship and had also written for a fellowship and we were both awarded and we didn't know. So I'm getting into California. Yeah, I get in San Diego. I'm getting to the hotel and going to go and register. And this person is coming, rushing towards me. And she hugs me and she says, my sister, did you apply? And I'm like, no. We had met in March on the East Coast. And now we're in California together several months later in October, November, actually. And, uh, and I haven't applied. And I said, you know, uh, Ola, I didn't apply. Nigeria. Your higher power is nudging you. Yeah. You know, you. I'll be very honest with you. When I saw this girl, it felt like my hair was standing on my head. I mm -hmm. felt so powerless. I've never felt so seen. It was like a crowd of people was looking at me and yet it's one person. And then she said, somebody, did you apply for that thing? And I was like, no, I didn't. She said, oh, you have to do that, you know, uh, because it takes time for them to process these things. And instead of asking her the specific thing she had asked me, she had told me, uh, I just tried to, as I said, you know, I will, I will apply, you know. And uh, I go back to my room that time. I'm like, hey, this is very weird, you know. Just how does this happen? How do you meet the same person in two different ways? You don't talk and you meet, Yeah, you know? At that moment, I knew that this was beyond me. It was not a somber thing. It was a higher power thing, you yeah. know? And stuff that happened later on, you know, it's it's very, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of interesting stuff that went on. But uh, cutting the long story short, um, I applied and uh, we got into COVID and, uh, you know, I applied and... Uh, you know, I honestly, Nancy, I look back and I'm like, OK, maybe I have to say this. Um, so when COVID was just about to happen, um, when COVID happened, actually, um, I was supposed to go to Oxford. I was going to be giving a guest lecture, you know, at the Said Business School. And for some reason, um, I wasn't feeling it, you know. My heart was just not at peace with me taking the flight on the 12th of March. So I arrive in, um, you know, I arrive in Heathrow on the 13th, you know. Yes. My heart just wasn't there. You know, it was Friday the 13th. So I woke up in the morning and, um, and I prayed. Mm. And as I was praying, I started crying, you know, uh, a long time ago when I was young, I used to go to a Pentecostal church. So uh, we used to cry a lot when we were praying at that church. But uh, I started going to a Baptist church. And in a Baptist church, you don't cry when you're praying. Okay. There's some sort of order. So I found myself in this moment, uh, March 2020, praying on the 12th of March. And I'm crying. And by the time I was saying amen, it was like I'd been in a totally different world. This will sound weird. That's what happened to me. And uh, it felt like, you know, I needed to do certain things. And I just followed through with those, you know. Um, so I got in touch with my colleagues at Oxford. I said, I'm not traveling because I don't feel like I should travel. That's part of the outcome of the prayer that I had. And then the other thing from that prayer was very specific. Submit your application and submit it before the 17th with a debt, you know. So I'm like, huh. Sombo, if you haven't gone crazy, this is when you've gone crazy. Because now you're even imagining being given debts in some weird prayers. Okay? So, natapa manje mawaya. Kapena kupanka glu kuika pamos. You know, so I know you have a global audience and uh, it's probably unfair to say stuff in, in, in my local language, but I love to speak Nyanja, you know. No, listen, and, uh... it, it, it adds <laughs> some, some song to it. <laughs> yes. So, so you know what I did? Um, I worked through the nights that followed and I filed that application. Okay. My application went in on the 16th and um, 16th was a Monday. Yeah. Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember. But uh, Friday was 13th, Saturday 14th, Sunday 15th. Yeah, 16th was a Monday. I filed in my application. It was received. They got the money from my bank account and they started processing, okay? 
Do you know what happened before the end of that week? President Donald Trump um, issued an instruction that they are to stop processing any immigration applications. Hey. When my application went in and was accepted, it was very specific from my prayer that it needed to go in by the 16th. And I did just that. And a few days later, that order was issued. So I sit back and I'm like, oh, okay. That was very interesting. Um, it's one of those things that makes you to get scared. But then also you're like, no, we have to share these stories because I think they're important to help yeah. somebody to listen yeah. in mm -hmm. a little bit more. So, so my application went in and um, it was a lot. You know, all the things that I've ever done, I put them there. Remember, I needed to demonstrate international acclaim. And I wrote, Nati Nizalemba. Yeah. You know, I'm going to write and prove that I deserve this, you know, and, uh, and I did that. And um, so the first, uh, the, the first letter that came a year after, you know, it was a letter that was requesting for more information. And now I was like, uh oh, is this thing going to work out? So I get in touch with my Nigerian friend. I'm like, hey, you know, you asked me to do this application, but they're asking me for more information. What am I supposed to do? And then she says, Sombo, um, there are usually three outcomes. Yes, no, or more information. So when you do more information, it means that you're in between yes and no. So depending on what you provide as more information, you may go to yes. And I was like, what? She said, yes. But you know, all the time, our minds, there's that element of like, this can be a no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is going to be a no. What are you going to do if it's a no? So I told myself, if this is going to be a no, I will have learned. I would have learned this whole process and what to do. And, um, and, and I'm not an attorney. And uh, so I had to start reading again. You know, like you read the letter several times so you can understand it. You know, you understand the English in yeah. the letter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I always say that British English and American English are two different animals, mm -hmm. you know. So now I started reading and I'm like, this is too technical. Is this a time at which you're supposed to engage an attorney? I'm broke. I can't get an attorney. An attorney costs more than $5,000 in 2020, yeah. 2021, you know, yeah. for that thing, an attorney costs more than $7,000, 10000 20 plus thousand dollars now. Forget so it. I'm like, forget it. You know, I'm not going to get in touch with an attorney because I don't have the money. I would do it. I'll do it alone. So I went on and uh, I just gathered up all the other evidence that they needed. Proving international acclaim is a very fluid thing. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really something, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes when you do certain things, people think that, you know, yeah. like, you know, and not knowing that it's those same Savaila and stuff that sets you apart. I brought in all my weirdness and I just wrote it down. I learned to write weirdness about myself because I was trying to prove international acclaim. My file was big, like really big. I think maybe 500 pages or more. Oh my God. Pieces of evidence. But they were just looking for me to meet the first three or three of the 10 criteria that they have set. And they read that thing and they were able to find that. And then they sent me, uh, you know, uh, Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving day, that's when I learned that I had been approved, um, you know, for the Albert Einstein, um, you know, um, award. So it's, um, it's very exciting. I think I learned a lot. Um, the waiting. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. You wait for more than a year and wow. you're doing something that is really hard, something that people have to pay somebody who is an expert to do, but you do it on your own. I look back and I'm like, huh, I'm really grateful for this. So um, it's it's really something that I'm so uh, proud of. And um, I haven't talked about this in public actually with a person. So yeah, I'm glad that I get to do that. <laughs> I get to do that here. It's literally yeah. one of the things that I had written on my notes. Yeah. I was I, going to I be asking that. you the Albert yeah. Einstein. And I yeah. knew from uh, even from your bio that you gave yeah. me yeah. that. You know, I it's something that's important for me to talk yeah. about. And I'm yeah. glad that you were able to share uh yeah. your obedience. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot yeah. of us are scared to be obedient, listening to that yeah. voice yeah. inside us. And uh yeah. wow. 
Yeah. You gave me chills. <laughs> yeah, you know, I this story always it it always you know, it always I'll cry afterwards. I'm not gonna cry, uh, not on this conversation, but it's a convers it's a story that always makes me to um realize that, you know, um that God knows the number of hair on our heads, even when it falls off, the balance that remains. I'm an accountant, so I'll talk about the balance. <laughs> <laughs> you know because just everything that happened up until being able to get that is just obeying and listening in you know and what followed after that and during the whole one year of waiting it was praying every single day like literally praying every single day you know just praying and believing that it's going to it's going to be a positive response. And then you get a request for more information and you're like, oops, is this going to work? And then your mind takes you back to like, no, no, no. He who promised is what? Faith. And it worked out. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, I've talked about this because it's an immigration story. You know, the Albert Einstein visa is an immigration program. So it is. Yeah, yeah it is. And it's important for, um, I'm grateful that you, shared that because when we are going through our immigration journey whether it's um it doesn't even matter what you're trying to get the stress level that you go to it's beyond like explaining yeah you no one understands it unless you've been through the journey yes yes so for you to be obedient and listening to yourself and listening to that voice and you start to have a prayer life literally you start to have a prayer life because your life depends on it mm -hmm. if it's a no your life completely changes how do i yeah. go back mm -hmm. home to go start yeah. my my life yeah. how are people going to view me because it's also now your mind just goes wild <laughs> <laughs> and you know uh People born in August are crazy overthinkers. Oh, yes. So I, I'm August baby. That's the curse you and I share. Yes. I'm calling it a curse because no, August I'm babies. I'm a processor. Yeah. yeah. Process August everything. babies just go crazy. You go, you switch gear into thinking. And I'm like, I'm pretty good at setting scenarios. Yes. So breathe in, breathe out. You know, the scenario of this, if this is a no, what's going to happen here? And then now you're trying to hold on to faith and hope. I'm like, it's going to be a yes. But your mind is still going to work because your, your August mind works. Sis, I live your life. Okay. <laughs> I live that life. I tell yeah. the whole story already. I'm in <laughs> next year. I mean, 10 years ahead. I tell the whole yes. story in yeah. my brain. <laughs> in my brain. So I, I'm so grateful that you're able to yeah. share your faith and... Mm -hmm. um, keeping us together as Leo's. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being outstanding. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you for being outstanding and thank you for being faithful um, and for sharing your journey with us today. Mm -hmm. I am... Uh, I My soul is very happy right now. I can't even express it. <laughs> to mm -hmm. the levels um having said that have you found your concrete pastures <laughs> that's a very interesting question um i think it's a journey yeah i think it's a journey and i think that for this phase of my journey yes i have mm -hmm. so i have to go to the next uh phase of my journey i like one of the things that Andrea Shields said I think he said um, the top of one mountain is uh, the bottom or the base or the beginning of another one yeah, the so uh, that's what I've carried through uh, when I was moving from being an accounts clerk to getting a job as a finance officer or project accountant then finance officer then acting country rep then country rep then you know getting into a PhD program and now as an assistant professor, um, all these have just been, you know, uh, uh, bottoms of new mountains. So um, I can say that for this phase, 
yes, I have found my concrete pack pastures, but um, I can level the game up and I am going to level the game up. And um, uh, I, I, I need to be open minded to uh, find uh, uh, my, my, my next phase, you know, to find um, new pastures. You're an overachiever. <laughs> what advice would you give to your fellow overachievers? Um, I think to be gracious like when is with it oneself. Now? Yeah, okay. that's what, yeah. You know, you need to be gracious with oneself and um, don't, don't become a machine. I always say this. I always tell myself, Sombo, don't become a machine, okay? Um, you need to learn to live and be happy living, you know, because this quest for success um, can dehumanize you, you know. Um, I'm, I've spent many sleepless nights, you know, to get stuff done. And, um, yeah, you know, so when you succeed, you want more success, okay? And uh, in this kind of game, it's not a space where you can flock your way through things. Yeah. This is substance, okay? Uh, this, is a, this, this is a journey of substance, um, and it's a journey of, um, you know, you need to have... Um, you know, your values straight, you need to have discipline um, to be able to get certain things done. It's it's not a space where, you know, you can pay your way through or fluke your way through by some conversation. No, you know, so and, and coming up with that substance is a lot and just building the discipline. I talked earlier about my practices around social media, for example, um, that's discipline. It's painful. Yes. Yeah. You know, you're basically missing out on what most people are doing, but that's what this calls for. So you either decide to miss out or to be with the crowd. So, and in doing that, it's very possible to lose yourself. You know, so um, don't get to the point where you lose yourself and you stop living and you stop um, enjoying the journey. I think the journey has to be enjoyed you know, and, um, and, and just being gracious with yourself to learn to say no. And this is also advice to myself, you know, because I think at times I, you know, overdo it, you know, like, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm like, I'm going to write this paper, I'm going to be working on this, and you keep doing that, but you need to be gracious with yourself. And you need to get to the point where um, you learn to enjoy every moment, and you learn to be thankful. And also curve out time to have fun, you know, to just love the journey, you know, to be able to enjoy what is happening and what you're doing. And uh, yeah, you know, go to the falls, the Victoria Falls. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Oh my God. My soul is just exploding. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. I am so grateful for blessing my soul and so many others that you're blessing right now. Um, thank you so much for making time for us, for inspiring us. And um, thank you for everything you're doing for us. Thank you for having me. So proud of you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh my God. Amazing. Thank you.